Uh, my name is Cindy Alvarez, and I this is pretty much what I do for a living these days, which, which seems odd. But basically, uh, I'm going to talk about customer development, and you know, it said the goal here is to to not build faster horses. So I'm going to talk about why this matters and how to do it right. So. I've been working in technology for the last 13 years, and basically I had no idea that this was what I was going to do. Uh, I kind of stumbled onto this by accident. I studied psychology in college and didn't actually want to be a professor. And if you're in that situation, then you kind of stand around wondering what you're actually going to do. And so and they made the decision to move out to San Francisco because I had a friend who was starting a startup. Didn't really know a whole lot. I, you know, kind of screwed around with computers in college, but didn't have. Wasn't an engineer. Certainly wasn't, um, you know, going to be a professional engineer, even though it's reasonably technical. I kind of liked design. I kind of liked writing. Wasn't really sure. So, and I think the first thing that I would say is, you know, when you don't know how to do something, learn it. So I was in a very small startup. I was employee number three, and so when things needed to be done, I had no one to point to and say, well. You do that. You're better at this than I am. There was no one who was better at, than whatever at whatever the thing was than me. So it was, you know, at the time HTML was out. CSS was a fairly new thing. So that was a technology that I had to teach myself because there was no one else there to learn it. Things like setting up our website, building a website, figuring out how when people come to your website they're going to actually do the thing you want them to do. That was all stuff that I had to kind of learn on my own. It was it was scary. And a lot of times I didn't really want to do it because it is a lot of work and you would rather kind of have someone else do it, but you have to. Um, and the other thing I learned along the way is that I would join mailing lists. This was before we had quite the social networks that we have now and I'd be on mailing lists and there would always be someone rattling off a whole lot of opinion about something and I would read it and I would think this is ridiculous. You know, they'd be saying something was impossible. I'd be like, but I did this. Or they'd made, make some claim that I just, didn't make any sense to me to be true. And it took me a while to realize that pretty much anyone can be an expert and no one is stopping you from trying to be an expert. So I started reading a lot of usability lists and I realized that there was no reason why I couldn't be as much of an expert as people who were posting through these lists claiming that they knew better. So if there is something that you find yourself really pulled into, you know, go for it, be an expert in that. Learn everything you can, start posting opinions, start asking questions. Um, you know, at some point, people will start recognizing you as an expert long before you actually feel like one. Uh, so, you know, fake it till you make it, I guess, is the thing. Um, the other, and, you know, being here in a room full of girls, I need to emphasize this more. Don't be modest. Stop being modest. Because all the boys out there will brag themselves silly. And it's really kind of obnoxious. But the thing is that... Um, I think a lot of people tend to be modest about their accomplishments because they assume that other people will know. So if you've done something that was really hard and someone says, wow, it was really great, and you say something like, oh, I was just lucky, they believe you. They believe that you were just lucky. They're not thinking, no, she actually worked really hard on this. So if you worked really hard on something or you did something really smart, take credit, own it. Tell people you did it. I mean, don't hog the credit, you have a team. But if someone says, you know, at the end of this, people are going to tell you, wow, that's a really awesome app. And it's okay to say, yes, it is. My team worked really hard on this, and we're really proud of it. And just as a, as a, as a course of, of, as a matter of course, as you're going through life, when you, know, when you do things and people tell you they're awesome, own it. Um, you know, because no one is going to do that for you except for your mom, and you can't actually bring her with you uh, much longer. So, you know, the corollary to that is fight back. So hopefully you don't encounter a lot of these, but you are going to encounter people in the workplace, sometimes they'll be male, sometimes they won't, who will try to put down your ideas. They don't really want you to be right. They don't really want to give up credit. And I discovered this in my very first startup where I worked with a bunch of guys. Actually, I was the only, so it was me, and there were 10 guys. And there were a couple of them who really, really didn't like the idea of taking any kind of instructions from a woman. And so I would say something, and these are the engineers, you know, so I'd say something, you know, we're going to build this, and they'd look at me and go, why? I don't want to. I don't think that's a good idea. And I, I wasn't really used to, I mean, they weren't even being nice about it. They were just being really blatant, just sitting there, crossed arms, staring around across the table. I don't want to do this. And uh, I was like, well, well I, I, I it, but this is what we're supposed to build. I mean, I, I you know, I kind of stammered at them. And I realized at some point that, People who do this to you don't expect you to fight back. 
And so I started every time someone said, I don't want to do this, I think this is a dumb idea, I would do the same thing back to them. Like, why? Why don't you think it's a good idea? This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is the reason why we're doing this. Do you have a reason why we shouldn't? And they had no idea what to do to this. Well, I just think it's dumb. That's not a good reason. If you can give me a good reason, I'm happy to listen to it. In fact, why don't you come back tomorrow? I'll give you 24 hours to think about it. Come back tomorrow. If you have a good reason, then we'll discuss it. And those, those challenges started going away real fast after that. So, you know, you're going to get people who are going to try and cow you and just, you know, do the same thing back to them. Like, fight your battles. If you know you're right and you have a good idea, stand behind it. So somehow along, somehow along the way of all this fighting back, I realized that you know, what I started out doing, which is sort of design and odds and ends, turned into interaction design. And then it turned into user research, because in these conversations where engineers would say, I think we should just build it this way because people will figure out how to use it. And I said, but they're not. I said, I talked to our users. They don't know how to use it. And they're like, well, they're just not very smart. I said, but they're the ones paying us. So it seems like. They ought to be able to use it, even if you think they're dumb. Uh, and this is kind of a rev revolutionary thing also, like that users matter, people matter. Um, you know, at the end of the day, whatever it is you're doing, somehow you have to get paid. And so people have to be able to use what you're putting out there. And that's how I kind of found my way, again, into, into user research, into usability testing. And um, when I started that, I didn't actually know how to do any of this. So I joined a company. I said, I can't believe you're not doing user research. You should do it. And my boss said, great, do it. And I didn't actually have any idea how one would conduct a usability session. And it seemed like a really big undertaking. And I, I called a couple of places to find out. And they're like, oh, yes, you, know, you can rent us for the day, $10,000 a day. My budget was uh, $500. So that was not an option. And so you know, it was a lot of steps. And when you're doing something that seems really immense, if you look at that whole immense picture, it kind of makes you want to crawl into a hole and not do it. And so I thought, well, what's the very first thing you would do? Well, let's figure out what we want to test. OK, we got this part. Now we need people. OK, let's try Craigslist. So we sent him out an email. Got a million responses back. Oh. That was easier than I thought. I guess now we need to winnow it down. And every single step in a process is actually pretty easy. And as a single step, if you don't know how to proceed, if you take one concrete action, you can always find someone who has a good idea. Oh, you have 300 you know, people on Craigslist. Why don't you put up like a free survey and ask them to answer one or two questions, and then you can pick the ones that are the best fit. Oh, that seemed like a good idea. That came from someone else in my company, so I did it. And then I got to the next step. So it just you know, kind of keeps going. And anything that you think you have no idea how to do, if you do that, tackle that one step at a time, it works really well. Um, and then finally, you know, everything benefits from the scientific method, I'd like to say, which is when you don't know what you're doing, the best way to approach that is to pretty much state that. I don't know what I'm doing. But here's what I think I should do. And what happens when you do that, when you say, here's what I think I should do, then you've got something concrete to move forward from. So you can try something. And if it doesn't work, and a lot of times it won't, then you have something very concrete. I thought this would work. I tried this. It didn't work. So based on what I know, I can make a better guess. And then at the end of this whole process, once you've done something, even if you have you know, failed magnificently, if you kind of look back and say, what did I think I was going to do? What did I try? How did it go wrong? You will have this wealth of knowledge so that next time it will go a lot more smoothly. So somehow, you know, over the last 13 years or so, that's where I got to, is doing all of this. And you know, where that's kind of gotten me is, right now I'm not an entrepreneur. I've actually never been an entrepreneur. But I've worked in startups my whole career. And I would say that you know, what, I, what I have accomplished is being able to have a pretty good sense of authorship over what I do. So, the job I have was not posted. It did not exist. The previous job I had did not exist. I've basically you know, been able to put myself in a position where I can find companies and go to them and say, look, you probably need someone like me. And here's what I think I should do for you. And oh yeah, this is what you should pay me. And it's worked. 
Um, and this is phenomenally useful to you. So like right now, I have a daughter. I have a two-year-old. When she was born, I got to work at home. So she was right there. Now I get to work pretty flexible hours. I get to see her. I get to spend time doing the other things I like to do. I like to run. I like to play soccer. I like to cook. Uh, you know, my life is very much kind of under my control, and that's a really nice thing. Um, so whatever it is you decide to do, if you kind of own all of these things, you'll have a lot more say over where you're working and who you're working with and, and kind of the, you know, the circumstances there. So, you know, that's a little bit about my background. And, you know, now I'll kind of get into the whole customer development thing. So there is a uh, theoretical Henry Ford quote. I say theoretical because now a lot of people debate whether or not he actually said this. But you know, Henry Ford, the assembly line, made, you know, made cars. He said, if I had asked what customers had wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. In other words, no one said, I need a car. You know, at the time, it was like this kind of crazy, wacky invention. People had horses and wagons. They seemed to do perfectly well. I'm sure people had complaints about them. But no one was saying, I need a car. And if Henry Ford had gone and knocked on some you know, wealthy landowner's door and said, you know, what would you change about your horse? They wouldn't have said, I want something completely different. They would have said, I want something kind of like what I have now, but better. But that's not what actually advances technology. That's not what makes our lives better. So what this all kind of boils down to is that people are terrible at telling you what it is that they want, and by extension, what they will buy and what they will pay you to use. So there's a sort of art form in how you pull that information out of people because we just, we already know, you can't ask them straight out. And the reason is that, you know, people are irrational. We don't act in our own best self-interest. We don't understand what's possible. So the universe is full of, you know, 99% of people are not engineers, are not programmers, are not technical. They have no idea what is possible. People didn't know that the iPod was possible, they didn't know TiVo was possible, like all the things that we take for granted before they existed, most people could never have even dreamed of them. So if you ask them straight out, they can't tell you something useful. And people are really bad at describing what it is they want. You know, it's like if you've ever been hungry and you want something, you're not really sure, and you're like, I don't know, maybe I want something salty. No, maybe I want something cheesy. Maybe, oh, I don't know. People are like that about everything. They can tell you if they see something, they might say, oh no, I don't want that. But you can't just show them everything in the world and wait for them to say yes to something. Like, we're just really, really bad at recognizing. Most people are not very introspective, we don't know. And what's even worse is that we're really bad at predicting what we're actually going to do. Um, and this can be across anything, whether it's something we like or we hate. You know, how many books are you going to read this year? I don't know, 50? Probably not true. How many miles are you going to run on Sunday? Five? Probably not true. How many times are you going to eat salad in the next, next month? You have no idea. And you have no idea what you did last month either because you're a normal person. And this is not something that's worthy of paying attention to. And even more frustrating is people are really, really, really bad at changing their behavior, even if they say they want to. And this can be really awful for you because you have some app that is almost certainly dedicated to getting them to change their behavior. And so what a lot of people will say is things like, oh yeah, I'm totally going to go to the gym three times a week. Right now they go zero times. Are they going to go three times? No. Are they going to go once? Probably not. You know, but you don't know this, and, and we're really bad at telling you this. So customer development is this art of trying to figure out not what people say they want, but what they actually need, because people are pretty bad at hiding what they really, really need if you ask the right questions. So where do you start? So those of you who have ideas might have already had something. I find that the most clear thing for me is to start with a hypothesis, a guess, and make it as specific as possible, and it will probably be wrong. Just accept that now, own it, it's okay. But by putting down something specific, you will be able to very clearly identify, yes, it was wrong, or no, it wasn't wrong, or it was kind of wrong, except for this bit. And the formula that works really well for a lot of ideas is, I think this type of person has this type of problem that they can solve by doing this type of thing. And that's just, it's a very clear case and it identifies all the parts that you're going to need to work on. As soon as you have that, the first thing you're going to try and do is disprove it. And I know that's not what you want to do, because the first thing you're going to want to do is get evidence that you're actually right. But every fiber of your being is going to be telling you that whatever your really good idea is, you want to stick to it. And 
you know, it's probably wrong, because almost everyone's first idea is wrong. It's OK. So by trying really hard to disprove it, if you've tried really hard to disprove it, and yet people still keep proving it, then that's a really good sign, and you should continue. So an example hypothesis, because I know the, the generic version of that can be kind of hard. So let's say, I think high school students, that's your type of person, have a problem, have a hard time studying SAT vocabulary. You know, they mean to, they're just not getting around to it. This is their problem. And I think they could help this by having an app that reminded them to study and help them study more effectively. So this could be your hypothesis. This is a perfectly good hypothesis. And it breaks down into, you know, pretty clear steps of action, which is, who are you going to talk to? High school students. What problem are you going to see if they have? SAT vocabulary. If you talk to high school students, and they all say, now we don't care about that. This is not a good app for you to build. Because that's your target market, and they're telling you, I don't have this problem. Um, and you know, would they use something like this? Let's say in some mythical universe, you talk to high school students, and they're all like, nah, I don't have a phone. Then this would not be a good product for you to build. But you know, for all three of these kind of segments, you want to look, is this true? You know, is, are these, do these people have this problem? Could they potentially solve it in this way? Is there anything that would stop them from solving it in this way? So once you have your hypothesis, what do you want to learn? What do you need to get out of customer development? First of all, you need to make sure that you know the problem. You know, what is the problem? Your hypothesis is having a hard time with the SAT vocabulary. That might not be. You might talk to people and they say, yeah, that's a problem, but you know, geography is really killing me. Whatever. You need to identify that. How is this person already trying to solve the problem? And this is pretty important because, like I said, people don't change behavior. They do occasionally. It's very rare. So let's say you talk to someone. You say, hey, you know, how are you prepping for the SAT right now? And they say, oh, I really need to get on that. I really need to, you know, I'm really bad with the vocabulary. I need to bring up my, my verbal score. And you say, oh, well, how, how are you studying for it now? They say, oh, well, I'm not. This is someone who is unlikely to take more action. What you want to look for is someone who says, oh, I really need to do that. Well, what are you doing right now? Well, I keep writing down words in my notebook, and I'm looking at it, but it takes forever, and I have so much to do that I don't get around to it, but you know, I, I try and look at it for five minutes every day at least. This is someone who has a problem and is trying to solve it. This is a good target market. If you find lots of these people, you're probably onto something with your idea. You want to find out what are their constraints, what are their objections. Again, so let's say someone didn't have a smartphone, then an app would not really solve their problem. Let's say mom doesn't let them use the smartphone after a certain time, then this might also be a problem. You know, maybe, maybe your app costs money and this is someone with no budget whatsoever, then this could be a problem. You know, in the working world, it might be something like, you know, with my company, it's things like, well, the guy who runs the IT department will let us install software. Or I don't have any budget at all, so I can only use free tools. Or I have very low technical ability, so whatever your product is, it has to be really easy. These are constraints. And if, you, if someone has these constraints and your product doesn't work with that, it, it's not really going to work. Who is involved? So this might be, let's say it's something where multiple people are involved. Um, you know, something where you need to do something and your friend needs to do something and someone else needs to do a third thing. Um, for example, I worked with a couple of startups that were trying to build uh, like grocery shopping apps. And the, the focus was kind of, for one of them, the focus was around eating healthier. And they're like, oh, well, our target is moms, because moms do most of the grocery shop shopping, and they want their family to eat healthier. And I said, well, well, who's involved? And they looked at me like I had two heads, and they said, uh, the moms who do the shopping. And I said, oh, so when mom goes to the grocery store and buys food, no one else eats it? I said, but... I said, so if mom goes to the grocery store and buys food that no one else in the house likes, they're going to complain, right? Yeah. So your recommendations better be OK for dad and the kids and whoever else is involved. Because if not, they're going to try and hijack this app. They're going to just reject it. You know, there's going to be a problem later on. So you know, finding out if there's anyone else involved other than the person you're selling to can be pretty important. And then the suck factor. How much does it suck? Does it suck a whole lot? You're hoping it does. If it's something where people say, yeah, it's kind of a problem. Yeah, I guess that's kind of annoying. That's, that's pretty low enthusiasm. That's someone who, maybe if you have the perfect app and it's free and you put it on their phone for, you, for them, they'll use it. 
but they're not going to they're not going to file bug reports. They're not going to use it when it's in a bad state. They're not going to, you know, email you back and say, "Hey, here are all the things you need to change about your app." They're not very enthused. You want people who are enthused, especially initially. You want people who think this is a really good solution. Uh, I'm going to use it even though parts of it suck, and then I'm going to tell you exactly how you can make it better. So, when you're talking to someone, you want to listen for emotion. You want to hear them like, you know, going, "Ah, I hate this." Then you're probably on to gold. So, getting into this, you've got you know what you've got to learn. Your next thing is finding people. So, even if you had no other resource, talking to anyone other than yourself and your group is probably good, because honestly, you already know the way you think. You're trying really hard to get other perspectives. You know, but beyond that, you want to find the people who you think are the people from your first example. Who do you think is going to use this application? Let's say, you know, in my example, high school students. Well, you know, you want to see where do these people live online? Where are they already asking about questions? You know, looking for support, hanging out, where you can get to them. You know, if I were doing this, since I'm not in high school, I would have to actually go find people via, you know, other routes. And it might be maybe there's college prep message boards that people are posting on. That'd be a good fit for someone who is doing something around SAT vocab. Maybe they're going to tutoring sites. Maybe they're looking at, um, you know, maybe they're posting on Twitter with some kind of hashtags. Maybe they're asking questions on Quora or you know Yahoo Answers about college admissions. People who are doing that are exhibiting behaviors that they care about the thing that you're working on. So finding that those homes for people can be a good place where you can kind of pop in and say, "Hey, I would really like to talk to some people about X." You know, and I'll get into some of the details of that later. And I think um, they've also got some of the templates that I've written on my blog that you guys can use. Um, is there a physical location where people congregate? Obviously, in the high school example, you have a rich supply of people that you could talk to who are in all of your classes, so that part's very easy. If I were doing this, though, I might talk to people who are tutors or people who are volunteer coaches or who work at the Y, because they all come in contact with a lot of teenagers, and I might be able to say, hey, I'm working on this app. Could you introduce me to some people or maybe you know, send forward on an email from me, you know, from you to them so that I could talk to them? So that's a good way to kind of reach out to a lot of people at once. Like one tutor might you know, be working with 10 kids. That's a lot easier than having to track down 10 people individually. Um, and then, you know, yeah, so connectors, people who know lots of people already. Um, I use all of these methods on a daily basis. I do a lot with Twitter and a lot with Quora because most of my stuff is about corporate software. But a lot of times I will also talk to people. I know consultants. I know people who do like temp work, for example. That's another great thing. I know some people who do temp work and they work at different, a different company every week. And so I might say, hey, do you know someone at company X that I could talk to? And again, you just say like, I'll write you, I'll send you an email. You can forward it on. I promise not to bother them and make you look bad. So that's, those are good sources for finding people. And the next thing you want to do is qualify them. Because it might be, let's say in the high school example, if I were to go to a high school, I'd have hundreds of kids around me. I don't actually have time to talk to hundreds of people. And probably not all of them are ideal. So you, first of all, you want to see, do they have this problem? You know, the people who already have perfect scores on their SATs, I don't need to talk to them. People who you know, aren't applying to college, not taking the SATs, don't need to talk to them either. People who already have really expensive college prep taken care of don't need to talk to them either. But there's a pretty rich source of people in between who have this problem that I could talk to. So a good way of doing this is if you have a big source of people, surveys. They're very easy to distribute. You can use SurveyMonkey for free. They're, they're very easy for the person in question to give you answers. And you can do a lot of them at once. And the way they tally up the, the information, it's pretty easy to parse out. So you can ask a few questions that qualify. So it might be, you know, are you planning on taking the SAT again? If someone says no, don't need to talk to them. They're not interested. You know, are, have you taken any prep classes before, yes or no? Are you interested in improving your score, yes or no? If someone answered three or four of those questions, you know, all with the correct answer, I know this is a good batch of people to talk to. Um, more than 10 questions, you'll lose people. And there's really not that much interesting you can get in an initial survey. So in the beginning, you don't even know the questions to ask. So you know, kind of keep it low. 
But the main thing you really want is to get their contact information because the main purpose here is now that you've qualified them, now you want to actually talk to them face to face. You ask a couple questions and then your last question might be, hey, are you willing to talk to me for 10 minutes on the phone or 10 minutes face to face? And you know, if so, give me your email address, give me your phone number. And a lot of people actually will. I found this really, really surprising. I actually still find this surprising, the number of people who are willing to give me an email address to talk. And um, surveys are, are, as I said, really easy. And the temptation for many people, I work with lots of startups, and they always want to do everything via survey. Because that first survey was so easy that it's very tempting. They think, this just took me a few minutes. I got a bunch of responses. I'll just ask all my questions via survey. This is a terrible idea because there's a lot of reasons. But because, first of all, people don't really like to write. People are, you know, they're, they're kind of busy. And you don't really know what direction they're going to go down. So if your survey questions are not worded particularly well, or if people aren't really sure what you're getting at, or they're just feeling lazy, you're going to get really bad data. So once you've qualified people, this, you don't need a whole lot of the conversations. Five conversations, better than 100 surveys. So you're going to learn a lot in one-on-one -on -one conversations, and you're going to get a lot of like, oh, I had no idea that that's where someone was going to go with this. So to the point, like I said, when you're asking for the time, and I'm always surprised by how many people give me their email address, part of it is that you have to follow a certain formula for doing this, or if you actually want good results, you do. And the first thing is that when you're asking for this, you kind of want to intrigue the person. Because you are asking for their time. You're, you're asking for something that they value. And so you have a good idea. You want to make that pop. You know, Do you have this problem? Do you wonder where your boyfriend is at this time? Is your SAT score really low and your mom's yelling at you? Like, yes. People are like, OK, I'm paying attention now. I, I, you know, what is this? Um, so that's like a, ver a really good first opening. You don't want to say, hi, I'm with Technovation Challenge, and we're trying to build an app, and I would really like to learn more about. No one is going to keep reading. Start with something interesting. If you really want to put bio stuff in, you can put that towards the bottom. But the first thing you want is someone to be like, wow, OK, I'm paying attention. Um, so the question is good. The other thing to realize, and I think this is the reason why so many people are willing to talk to you, is that people really like to sound smart. And people really like to complain. So if you give them the opportunity to do one of these things or both of these things, they will, they will do it. Um, they will take 20 minutes if they get to sound smart at the end of it or if they got to rant on something. So you know, this is their opportunity. This is what you're giving them in return. Um, it actually is surprisingly rewarding. Um, you want to be honest. Like, I don't have a product yet. This is less important for you guys because people don't assume that. But in the corporate world, you can't go and be like, well, I am the director of this, and I'm very important, and I want your, no. It's like, hi, I'm working on a product. I don't know if it's going to be built or not. I'd really like to ask you some questions. You have to be humble. I'd like to learn from you. You know, be appreciative. This is really going to help. We honestly don't know what we should do with this. But by talking to you, we can know. So it would be really, really useful. Um, you know, just warm enthusiasm. Again, people are giving you time, so, you know, Thank them in advance. Lay out exactly what you need, and I cannot stress this one enough. If someone were to email me and say, hi, I'd like to interview you for a project, dot, 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 I don't think I would respond. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, do I need to prepare? Do I need to study? Is this going to be like an hour-long interview? What's going, like, are they going to call me back again and again? Like, this sounds hard. But if you say something like, I would like to talk to you about X. It will take 10 minutes. Here are three times that are good for me. Are these good for you? That's really easy. Now I know, OK, one conversation, 10 minutes, one of these three times, yes, I can do that. Like I can hit reply and say yes in five seconds, and it's really simple. And I feel very confident that this is something I can handle. And you know, like I said, super, super easy. I always recommend suggesting times. You know, you want to meet on Tuesday at 5 o'clock. You know, at this Starbucks? Do you want to meet Wednesday at noon at this lunch table? You've, you've basically taken all of the work out of the equation. All they have to do is show up and get to sound smart. So what do you do once you have them there? 
This part is really hard, I'm not gonna lie. Um, when I started doing this, I had to like steal myself up every time and I'd sit there and I'd make a good cup of coffee and I'd get myself a cookie and I would stare at the phone for a few minutes and I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna get on the phone, I'm gonna talk to someone, it's gonna be okay. And I would open with this question, which is the best because it just lets people talk, which is basically, tell me about your, how you're currently doing whatever the thing is. Tell me about how you're currently studying for the SATs. And then just shut up and listen. And listen for a long time, like long enough that you feel like kind of a jerk for letting the phone go on. Or if you're face to face, if you're face to face, it's good to have a notebook so you can pretend to be writing. Um, then you don't feel like as much of a jerk. But most people when confronted with silence will keep talking. And this is really good because you're gonna learn. So when someone asks a question like this, the person will probably say, well, I don't know, I look at my vocab about once a week and I, and they'll look at you and you're still silent. Well, I really need to do this, but I'm having a really hard time with this part because I don't have a lot of time and there's a bunch of words that I still don't know and I keep asking my mom to drill me but she's really busy and sometimes I like to put them on my notebook and bring them with me to piano practice. I mean, people just go on and on and somewhere in this on and on is really useful information. So start out with that. Let them talk for basically as long as they want about how they're doing what they're doing today. At some point then you will ask other questions. But a lot of times you actually get the most useful stuff out of this first one. As for what else you're gonna ask, you said in the beginning we had a hypothesis. Based on that hypothesis, you're gonna figure out there's some risks. And I mentioned a couple of them. If you have, you know, if say high school students don't actually own smartphones, then they're not gonna be able to get an app. If someone doesn't care about the SAT, they're not gonna get this app. If, you know, and it may be other things like, you know, in order to do this, I need to get, in order to break even, to make it worth my time, I need to get at least 100 people using this app. What if I can't get 100 people to do it? What if I, you know, what if I have no way of reaching 100 different students at once? You know, what if there's a better app out there that's free that other people are using? Anything that might be a risk to this project, write it down. If it's something that you can possibly discover by asking a person, those high risk assumptions are what you're gonna wanna test first. Do you have a phone? Are you able to use it? Are you taking the SAT again, et cetera? You wanna test those first. You wanna ask how, what, why, when, who questions. Because if you ask a yes or no question, the answer will always be yes. Would you use this app? Yes. Would you like it if it had this feature? Yes. Would it be better if it was free? Yes because it is, it is completely free for them to say yes. There is no cost to it whatsoever. Everyone thinks, sure, of course I would like this, but it doesn't follow through. You could ask me just about any question about any software whatsoever, and I would answer yes, and then I would never bother to follow through. So when anything that you have that you want an actual answer on, you know, are you planning on taking the SAT again? Yes. How about, when are you planning on taking the SAT again? I'm taking it in June. Okay, good. That's a commitment. Now you know someone really is taking it. They're not just answering you, you know. Do you have a hard time studying? Yes. How about when's the last time that you tried to study and didn't actually do it? Or, you know, how many hours do you think you should be studying compared to how many hours you actually are? Questions that really get at this kind of detail are going to be the, are going to, you know, show you whether or not someone's really has this problem is going to use this app. You will have questions written down. You do not have to ask them all. A lot of times it does not make sense to ask them all. There are three things that you really need to listen for when you're talking to people. And you can hear this on the phone, you can see it in people face to face. And the first one is the most important, and it's emotion. When someone is getting upset about something, if they're getting angry, if they're laughing about something, if they're enthusiastic, that's interesting. That is something that they care about a lot, and that means you want to know more about that because this thing that they care about a lot, if your app covers that area, they're going to like it a lot more. I've heard people doing interviews badly where they'll ask a question and the person will give a very non-committal answer. Oh yeah, I use that software. And then they'll say something kind of, oh yeah, you know, I really like this other thing. And the person's like, okay, my next question is, like, wait, 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 but the person just said they really liked something. You want to know more. What did they really like? Why did they really like it? How did they use it? What, what was good about it? 
these are things you want to dig in more to. If someone says like, oh yeah, I'm using this test prep software and you know, it's actually really good. Oh, why is it really good? Have you used other things? Why is this one better? You know, those are things you want to know. And even if that means every other question on your list doesn't get answered, that's okay. Surprises. If you really thought people were gonna say something and they say something completely different, this is also really interesting because odds are other people who were trying to solve this problem didn't know about this surprise concept. Maybe the surprise is that, you know, ah, I don't know, people who, you know, people were wondering about where their boyfriend is at a certain time, actually, they're wondering because they're cheating on him. Wow, that's interesting, that's a surprise, wait. These people are suspicious, let's find out more. Maybe there's some target market to serve here. And the last thing is tangents. A lot of times people will go off on a tangent and you kind of want to stop, and a lot of times that's the most interesting thing. In medicine, they call this the doorknob question. They say that doctors say that most of their patients will go through an entire physical, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. No, I'm feeling great. Okay, as they're leaving, the hand is on the doorknob and they're like, by the way, is it unusual that I have a green spot right here? It's been getting bigger and bigger. And the doctor's basically like, you spent a half hour in here and you got your hand on the door and you're asking about the green spot now. People wait. People hide these things. So if they're answering a question and they've answered your question, they're like, yeah, and then there's this kind of interesting thing where I do this and then this happens and then that's kind of, you know, like, poke on that a little bit. Make sure that's not a really interesting doorknob question kind of thing, because it might be. Once you've had conversations and, you know, the number is gonna vary a lot. Five, I say, is a good useful number. I've never had to do more than 30. I know that sounds like a lot, but there's more of you. There's a lot of you, so you can divide it up. I've never had to do more than 30 to have a really strong sense that, yes, this is a really good idea. No, this is a terrible idea. Yes, this could be a good idea if X and Y. Like, by then, you just have a really strong signal. People will fall into patterns of, you know, I like this. I have this problem. I've tried this thing before. I, you know, I'm this level of excited about it. Um, so you're gonna get these things about what are the problems. You're gonna see what do these people have in common. So maybe you'll see that all of the people who really like this thing have this particular trait. Maybe they're all people who are really good at math or they're all people who play a lot of sports and so they don't have a lot of time. Maybe they're all people who are working moms or they're all people who work in IT. This is also useful because it's often easier to build something that works really well for a small set of people than to try and work, build something that works well for everyone. That actually is almost impossible. Very few companies can do that. Twitter is probably one of them. Um, and then what else do you wish you'd asked? When you're looking at your notes, it might start jumping out at you like, God, why didn't we ask this thing? You can always go back and do that later. And that's a good time for really introducing the survey. So in the beginning, when you don't really know what to ask, you don't really know what you're looking for, that's a terrible time to try and do all your research via survey. But once you have those strong signals, you might want to look and say, okay, I have this good idea, but I'd really like to survey 500 high school students and see how many of them might use this app of mine and, and, and you know, what they're doing as far as a problem type solution. So that's a really good time to follow up because there's no way you could possibly do a face-to-face -face or phone interview with 500 students. But you could probably convince 500 of them to take a short survey. And you might get that back and say, wow, of the 500 people, 400 of them said they'd pay $5 for this app. This is a very good sign. This says build it now. So, you know, this is, but the staging of it is very important. Because if you try and do big surveys up front, you're going to get data. You're not really going to be sure what it tells you. It's going to be frustrating. You know, the conversations are, are, they are very hard, but they are very useful. And that's pretty much... That's pretty much the how-to. You're gonna get, like I said, you're gonna get templates. So for things like um, follow-ups via tweets, follow-ups via emails, introductions to people. There's formats that I've used and I've, I keep kind of tweaking and perfecting that are pretty good at getting response rates. So you'll have that. Um, but just as you go, really, it is amazing what people will tell you. And all of the questions you can answer now, all the mistakes you can make right now before you start actually specking out an app and writing code and marketing and all of the rest of that stuff is going to be incredibly easier. Right now is the cheapest time you will ever have to make mistakes. So make plenty of them. <laughs>